I'm Norm Robbins with RenoArts.News, and I'm here with Maestro Martin Maikut, who will be uh, leading our Reno Chamber Orchestra Saturday evening in a Sunday matinee. And welcome to Reno, Maestro. Well, thank you very much, Norm, and you nailed the last name, so thank you for that, ah, too. Ah, good. <laughs> well, I, I, I practiced it once. <clears throat> You come from Slovakia. You were born in Bratislava. That's right. You were educated in Bratislava. You came here in 2003. I looked all over the internet, and I'm good at this, <laughs> and I could not find your birthday. Ha, huh, interesting. I'm not hiding my birthday. Good, tell so us. I'm 44. You were born in? 75. 1975. Yeah. The reason I ask is I want to place you in the history of Slovakia. Ah. Slovakia, few people know about it. It has had a tempestuous 20th century history. Very much so, yeah. <clears throat> it started in 1918 at the end of World War I with the dismantling of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. That's right, where the <clears throat> Czechs and, and Slovaks decided to create a union. <clears throat> when, they broke up, when they broke up the empire, the Hungarians got their country. The Romanians got their country. The Bulgars got their country. The Slovakians did not. That's right. You, yeah. were, you were put in with the Czechs into Czechoslovakia. Tell us about that. Well, unlike all these other nations, Slovakia was a fairly new entity. You know, it's a, it's a really interesting, uh, I keep thinking about this, what um, makes nation a nation? You know, at some mm -hmm. point, um, a, a substantial number of people decide that they're, they are their own thing, right? And they unite and the language gets unified. But um, so Slovakia was uh, comparatively a, a new nation. So maybe okay. that's why it was uh, uh, in, in uh, a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Hungarians, it wasn't very favorably, favor, favorably inclined towards, uh, uh, you know, this pursuit of, of uh, of the nationhood of Slovaks. Mm -hmm. So uh, the way I look at it is that the uh, Czechs, by offering us this uh, union, uh, they, they might have saved the nation of Slovakia because the, 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 the Hungarians had a, a very powerful influence and uh, a lot of the national institutions were suppressed in Slovakia. But that's an ancient history. Then we were with Czechs together. Uh, but then uh, Slovaks were still not quite satisfied because uh, many Czechs uh, saw us as an offshoot of, uh, of sort of a little maybe a, a, a ethnic variation on Czechs to which Slovaks objected. So uh, there was always this uh, little tension going on. You would, um, you would say in, in, uh, in, in Broadway terms, you were playing Brussels to uh, Prague's uh, Paris <laughs> You were playing New Jersey <laughs> to Prague's New York. Exactly. Got it. But, you know, good things can come out of that uh, tension when it's just, you know, creative tension. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so uh, I, th I thought it was a, we have a wonderful relationship with Czechs. Uh, uh, we, we had a Velvet Revolution together in 1989, and then we had the Velvet Divorce in 1992. And, I want to get um, into that. Yes, so um, um, I want to maybe preempted this uh, this question because we still are very close uh, Czechs and Slovaks are considered uh, you know sort of brother brotherly nations are the languages close languages are very close but you're talking to someone who was raised bilingual the uh, we had a federal TV so 50 percent was in Czech 15 Slovak so we all grew up bilingual mm -hmm. however um, for the young generation people who were born after the separation it's not as easy to understand. I mean, it's, for us, it's not, not, we don't even realize it's a different language, but uh, it's harder now. And if you, as um, a, an American, learn, say you learn Czech, and you go to Bratislava, you will have a hard, little bit of a hard okay. time to understand, and vice versa. So okay. they're quite similar, um, but not identical. <laughs> okay. Well, there is a little bit of a personal history uh, uh, here as well, because uh, my father was a journalist at that time. He was actually uh, uh, friendly uh, with Dubček. He was, they were acquaintances. 
and uh, then the Soviet invasion, hap Soviet invasion happened, and my father, like many others, signed a protest note, and as a consequence, that was the end of his journalistic career, yes. and for the next 20 plus years, he um, worked in a chemical factory. Mm. Cause communist, because communists made sure everyone was employed. That was a, a big deal, uh, a big you know, propaganda piece. Mm -hmm. But they made sure that you really did not like your job. Okay, you <laughs> okay. so we're up to that point in, his <coughs> in history. Tell me about the music that reflected the times and what the composers thought about the times. Well, the music, you know, historically was very much connected. <coughs> if you think of my hometown of Bratislava, which is uh, less than 50 miles from Vienna, Austria, um, and not that far from Prague, a lot of artists would, would make a stop there, you know, all your Mozarts and Beethovens mm -hmm. and, and etc. Uh, on their way from one big city to another, they would stop in Bratislava. So, so that area was very uh, culturally, um, you know, au courant, as they say in France. Au courant, yes. Um, and, it was um, very current, very, up, very up, up to the times. Very current. And then, uh, so I think the, uh, the thing that changed in, uh, under communists <laughs> that they wanted very accessible music. And as uh, uh, music lovers know from the history of Shostakovich, he's the greatest example of that tension between, okay, so how much accessible is uh, selling out and, you know, how much modernism is too much. So I think sort of the same processes were happening in... You're, in you're, as, you're asking my questions for me. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Apropos of that, let's talk about Zelenka. Yeah. Did I pronounce it correctly? Zelenka, yes, perfect. He, he, was, he was controlled by the communists. Yes, yes. As was Shostakovich. Yes, yeah. Difference, difference in degree, difference in kind. What were the similarities and differences between the way Stalin treated Shostakovich and whoever the powers were yeah. treated Zelenka. Well, I say that compared to uh, uh, the, the nations of, so of the Soviet Union, we had communism light. It, you know, whereas <laughs> Stalin would kill millions. You know, comparatively, very few died in, in Czechoslovakia. He killed so, twenty million. Twenty million. I know more than Hitler. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, so I would say also that the pressure exerted on, mm -hmm. on creative uh, types were, was, you know, on a scale, on a different scale, but uh, the dynamics was the same. And uh, Zelenka, Zelenka was uh, a very progressive composer, but, uh, but he was, uh, you know, periodically falling out of, uh, out of favor with the mm -hmm. authorities. And uh, uh, he had long stretches of time when he could not, uh, Compose or his pieces were not mm. performed, and so he did a lot of movie music, mm. and he also did a lot of uh, sort of lighter genre music. Uh, he he to, also did a vocal piece about Auschwitz. That's right. That's oh wow, you do. I'm I'm very impressed. Very composers well, I, of that uh, post-war generation, uh, and his music I think sort of uh, crystallized into in it's it's fairly modern. You know, it's intellectually very. Uh, uh, very well sh uh, chiseled, I would say, mm. um, but it's accessible. It's, it's still people can connect to it. And so he mu his music uh, uh, carries on. Um, I actually, um, as, a, as, a ch as a teenager, I might, I might have been 10 or 11, I uh, remember uh, visiting mm. Maestro Zelenka, who was a big authority, because I was premiering his uh, piece, actually it was an a collection of six pieces for young pianists. So okay. I went to his uh, house and played it for him, and um, uh, and then I played it for public. I, I don't recall much about yeah. it. I, I like the pieces. I know that. Okay, <laughs> let's let's, let's jump ahead of ourselves right. and go to his piece that you'll be performing. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to pronounce it because I know I'm going to mangle it. So tell us the piece. Musica Slovaka. Slo music. I would have said that. Musica, Musica Slovaka. Slovaka. Oh, yeah, it's easy. It's it's a, uh, well, I didn't know what syllable to put the accent on, <laughs> Slovaka. Uh, it, it seems like a, a somber piece. It's melodic, but it's somber. Well, I think that uh, I realized when I started living in the United States how much 
uh, the uh, melancho melancho melancholy, melancholy is part of the of the national psyche of Slovaks. Okay. Uh, you don't see it when you live there. I, I think they they may even disagree, but uh, from the outside. I think that's very well projected in this music. It's a beautiful melodic piece, but there is something wistful about it. Yeah, for sure. And I have, uh, it may even be the, I'm not sure if it's a US premiere, but I would say West of Rockies, I doubt this piece was ever played. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, uh, I always liked that piece, and I thought it would serve well for me to introduce myself in, in the community. Plus I had this fabulous uh, violinist, uh, uh, on hand, yes. and I twisted her arm, I twisted that about. hand, yes. and uh, so she's going to play that piece on top of the concerto. Oh, really? Oh, yes. good. Yeah. It, um, there are several versions, but this the version we're going to play is for uh, solo violin and string ah, orchestra. Okay. Well, actually, uh, there was one, one point I wanted to make. Uh, the, the Velvet Revolution, that was, uh, I consider that a, a defining moment in my life. It was an incredibly powerful period of time. Uh, when Good. Let's segue to you. Let's start there. Okay. Okay. I didn't want to put a spotlight on me like that, but but I did. I, I do. Did. I do. <laughs> Go ahead. So, um, yeah. It, so what happened there uh, for about the week? For about the week, it was about it was uh, sort of like what Beethoven envisioned in his Ninth Symphony. Everyone was just brothers and sisters. Yes. Strangers would meet on the street spontaneously struck uh, conversation. There was no crime for about a week. Nobody, mm. nobody stole anything. And, uh, and this is in a country that's relatively poor. That's, uh, yes, yes, you might say so. Uh, and we thought that's what capitalism was about. I said, oh, this is what we have been missing. And while we were, you know, uh, enjoying this wonderful feeling of uh, newfound feeling of brotherhood, mm -hmm. uh, the communists already turned their coats and became the, the nouveau riche, you know? Yes. So, but anyway, that's a different story. But, but the, the, the feeling from that week mm. is something that I will always carry with, with me as, as one of the most precious memories I have. Thank you. That's a beautiful story. <laughs> so, uh, Václav Havel takes over. Yes. And he's a playwright. And he's succeeded by Václav Klaus, who understands economics. And speaking of the, <clears throat> the oligarchs and the state-owned properties, he takes the state-owned properties, issues stock, establishes a, a Prague stock exchange, and everybody gets a proportionate share. And you can buy some more, you can sell it, you can do what you want. And it was so successful, none of the ex-communist countries copied it. Yeah, but also it was, uh, the way you presented it, I, you know, everyone got a, a stock. So all these, national, all these national treasures, the factories, everything, poof, disappears, and you get 10 cents in the mail. Yes. That's the, that's the amount okay. we're talking about. Nobody was getting rich. That, okay. It was, uh, so, okay. Um, but yeah, we had the, the tr transformation to, com to capitalism was quicker in yes. Czechoslovakia than in many other countries. Every, everybody said, no, you have to do this slowly. Uh, uh, and Klaus came along and said, no, you can't go from driving on the right side of the road to the left side of the road and do it slowly. It's yeah. not going to work. Well, I, I, he was, uh, I think he subscribed to a, a, you know, he probably was reading The Economist, you know? <laughs> uh, I think that's, uh, <laughs> okay. I, Let, yeah, I'm not an expert in that area, but let, uh, let's, go to let's part just say uh, 30 years from <coughs> the revolution, life is pretty good in Central Europe. Now, mm -hmm. uh, it has its problems uh, politically, just like the rest of uh, Europe has, but in terms of if we're just focusing narrowly on material wealth, mm -hmm. I don't, I, it would be hard to argue that the old times were better. It would be very hard to argue that. Okay. Let's go to part two. All right. <laughs> to the maestro. Talk about music. What, what brought you to music? <laughs> what was the attraction? Were you from a musical family? No, your father was a journalist. Uh, yes, uh, both my parents were journalist, journalists, but we happened to have a piano in the house. And uh, it was just a um, custom, you know, in Central Europe. 
you know, you put kids through some musical training. It's almost by default. So, okay. so because we had a piano in the house, I started taking piano lessons. I uh, took a liking to it. Nobody ever forced me to practice. Um, I just did as much as I wanted, and uh, I did well. I won some competitions, and uh, before you know it, I was at a conservatory. Very uh, good. Yeah. How would you rate the quality of the conservatory in Bratislava? Uh, so this is, when I got to the conservatory, this is right before the, the revolution. Mm -hmm. Which and, one? Uh, which was uh, 1989. Okay. And uh, the quality was very high. Okay. Being a musician in a, communism, in a communist regime was very attractive because you could travel west. Um, mm -hmm. Many, uh, there were very few fortunate people who could tr travel freely. Uh, musicians were among the very selected groups. So mm -hmm. uh, everyone wanted to be a musician. So, uh, and that completely changed after the revolution. That, now it's like, it's here. Which means you're you going to get... You want to be, go, go, your kids want to be in, in business or be lawyers or... Okay. or which, you no, know, nothing wrong with that. But, uh, but back then it was a very strong, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was very, very strong uh, and musical And you're programs. a reflection of it. And you got I a doctor's so. degree there? I got a doctoral degree eventually, yes. Um, I made it all the way to the doctoral okay. degree, and uh, I, I was still uh, uh, <laughs> unsatisfied, I suppose, so I got another one. Okay, in, but, but in you the got US. the second one in the U.S. That's right, yeah. <clears throat> and in 2003, you came here on a Fulbright scholarship. That's right, yeah. And you Actually, did... I never meant to get those doctoral degrees. They just happened. I was just, okay. it, it always made good sense for me to stay in school for one more year. <laughs> I went and eventually to they bestow those I, degrees on I, me. I, I, went, I went to school <laughs> with people like you. Okay, Martin, you're out of degrees. <laughs> Nothing more we can grant you. Now what are you going to do? Look, I, I think I'll go to work for a living. I, I loved being in school. I loved spending time in a library. It was a wonder, it's a wonderful place to be. Academia okay. is a wonderful place to be. But then there, at some point, there was, it was time to move on. And now, <laughs> now, now you're the music director for the Rogue uh, River Valley Symphony. Rogue, uh, Rogue Valley Rogue Symphony. Rogue Valley Symphony. And the Queens. And Queen Symphony. Symphony. Yes. So you're on both coasts, back, forth, back, forth. Back and forth, back and forth. That's is, it, is it taxing on you? So uh, it's uh, very exciting. Okay. Uh, and that is the most important thing. Yeah, they're very different orchestras, different organizations, different communities. Uh, is it uh, taxing? Yes, they are. You know, so <laughs> I, I don't lack in um, enthusiasm. Uh, I sometimes lack in sleep. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Okay, let's talk about what you're going to be performing. All right. You will be performing a range of things over time, over space. Starting with, and I'll probably mango the name, Chimarosa. Chimarosa, right on, yes. Okay. Yes. And he wrote something called, composed something called Il Maestro di Capella. Yes. Which yes. in my translations comes out as the master of the chapel, the master of the chorus, and the master of the orchestra. Yes. Uh, so it is actually what Germans called uh, their Kapellmeister. So uh, it's a position... It's a hybrid between a first violinist and a conductor. Okay. But I think that for, of those three, it's closest to the conductor of the orchestra. Got it. So, and, and he wrote a lot of operas, none of which, to my knowledge, are being performed today. Yes, he, he wrote, he was of that uh, generation that wrote these uh, mini comic operas mm -hmm. that were performed originally during intermissions of more serious pieces, but they became so popular with the, with the mm -hmm. audiences that they became the more, main focus. Um, mm -hmm. So, and El Maestro di Capella is, is one of those operas. It's, I think it's about 50 minutes long. It's not very long at all. Yes. It was just a, a break in a very serious opera by a different composer. Okay. Uh, and uh, I wanted to present a sort of a, a spectrum of, of, of musical styles for my mm. concert. Uh, and so I, so Chima Rosa represents the earliest example, sort of a- 18th century. Yes, uh, early very early classical music. Okay. But uh, I just could not resist. The music is very good. It's very upbeat. And, uh, 
it's interesting to sort of hear like a Mozartian idiom, but by somebody else than Mozart for change, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it's virtuosic, it's fun, but also the story of the opera, it's about a terrible music director. So I just could not resist the <laughs> irony of it. Okay. <laughs> well, he wrote comic operas. That's so that's comic. why that piece is on the program. Okay. Hinastera. Hinastera, Hinastera is, a, is a fantastic, uh, it's one of the uh, great pieces for chamber orchestra, mm -hmm. period. Yes. Uh, Argentinian composer. The piece is called uh, Variaciones Concertantes. It's a set of variations, mm -hmm. and uh, almost everyone in the orchestra gets a spotlight. Gets a, uh, it's a, it's and no, a, a, no tango rhythms in there. No tango rhythms. Gaucho with, rhythms. Yes, yes, yes. That was Piazzolla. <laughs> that was the generation before. Uh, Inestera, less, way less so. Yes, yes. So, but it is folk music oriented. Uh, okay. uh, the theme, actually, the uh, people will... Um, uh, come to the concert, which I hope will be many of, uh, of you. Uh, the, the piece starts with the harp, and the pitches you hear are pitches of a, of a guitar, just, mm -hmm. just uh, open strings on mm -hmm. a guitar. Mm -hmm. So that's right away he puts you in that, uh, in that mindset yeah. of, a, of a folk music. And, and he's got a huge oeuvre. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Very, uh, yeah. Very prolific. Very prolific okay. composer. And, uh, and so does Zelenka. So is Zelenka, that's right. So uh, that you found a connection I wasn't aware of. Although both of these pieces are based on folk music. Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of a connection there. Okay. So uh, Hinastera is my big piece uh, since I decided to share. I mean, it's not mine cause every, because everyone will have that, those big solos. Mm -hmm. But I decided to share the second half with a soloist. Okay. Uh, just to keep things fresh. Okay, and that brings us to Beethoven. <clears throat> beautiful, beautiful concerto. I, I would be happy just listening to the second movement. Yes. yes. Very lyrical. Would you talk to that? It's a, it's a monumental architecture. It's a, it's a, a substantial piece, I, mm -hmm. I believe 45 minutes or so of music, built of the most elemental particles in music. The second movement that you like so much, and mm. I, I agree with you. Thank you. It's the theme is just the horn call. It's just the mm -hmm. one of the most rudimentary gestures in mm -hmm. music. It's very very simple, and uh, so the genius of Beethoven is to take something so so simple, and create this incredible, uh, colorful, yeah. beautiful. Uh, I'm, I'm musical very, tapestry around I, it. I'm very fond of quoting Beethoven. <laughs> I can force you to listen to my music. And he does, doesn't <laughs> he? He does, he does. <clears throat> well, it's also the only concerto I can think of that starts with a timpani solo. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I can't think of, a, of another one. I can think of symphonies that start with a roll, but this, yeah, it starts with a timpani solo. That brings it's a, up. It's a, an, it's a pretty brazen gesture. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you put yourself in the mind of the audience in uh, mm -hmm. 18th century Vienna, it was okay. unheard of. <laughs> now, I've also heard that Beethoven changed concerti forever with this concerto. That's that he correct. made them longer, he made them more symphonic. Would you address that? Yes. Every concerto. Uh, uh, written after this one, uh, had to sort of uh, uh, wrestle with the legacy of, of Beethoven. And uh, every great soloist ever since that time uh, felt compelled to uh, include the concerto in, the, in, the, in its repertoire. Joseph Joachim, the friend of Brahms, he said there are three great concerti, uh, Beethoven, Mendelssohn, and Brahms. Um, Tchaikovsky didn't make the cut? Not for, not for Joachim. Okay. Yeah, there's another, that's another interview. <laughs> uh, because uh, Brahms wrote the concerto after he heard Tchaikovsky concerto performed in Vienna, and he detested it. <laughs> and he said, I will show you how a concerto should sound like. So okay. anyway, uh, so yeah, the, the legacy is, is uh, phenomenal. And uh, there is a lot of, in, the, in its simplicity and the scope, uh, there is so much just profound 
beauty, be beauty with lots of lots of uh, um, you know a lot of weight uh, in it. I would okay. say if that's not if it's not too convoluted. I mean, you can just enjoy that concerto just on a visceral level as a beautiful piece for a soloist and orchestra. But there is there are just layers of 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 uh, deep thinking that uh, that was and that was something that was not. You know, concerto was a vehicle for a soloist to just mm -hmm. go and show off. And so this was completely unheard of, you know, to come up with a concerto okay. where, where you basically explore the depths that, that uh, you only reserve the symphonies for, maybe. It's the sort of thing I would expect from Beethoven. Yep, he was a, uh, he, he, he talked about a revolutionary. Let's button it up. Is there anything you would like to say to the people of Reno besides come see your concert Saturday night or Sunday afternoon? <laughs> well, the reason I, I, I wanted to come here is the reputation of the Reno Chamber Orchestra. I've heard, you know, we're a gossipy bunch in our business and I've heard so many good things. So I'm, uh, I was tickled when I got the invitation. And uh, so you have a real gem here in this community. and. Uh, I just cannot wait to share the stage with them, and I hope uh, you'll come to hear this beautiful program. And there you have it. For more information, for ticket information, please go to www.renochamberorchestra.org. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.